Hey everybody, welcome back uh, to Pennsylvania at Fredericksburg. We are uh, a few miles uh, to the south from where we were at Marie's Heights at the Fredericksburg Battlefield Visitor Center just a few minutes ago. Uh, we've moved to the Slaughter Pen Farm, uh, which is a property that is uh, owned and managed by the American Battlefield Trust. Uh, if you come down to Fredericksburg, definitely want to come and check out this incredibly preserved property that they have here. Preserves a really key part of this battlefield um, that not as many visitors get to. So this understanding the southern part of the battlefield is what we're going to do next as part of this program. So as part of that, I want to get a little bit into uh, Pennsylvanians who are in the higher levels of command in the Army of the Potomac. And that is why we have Avery Lentz here, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, some of those Pennsylvanians in the command structure of the Army of the Potomac. So tell me a little bit about the command structure. So, you know, as we briefly discussed at the intro, the Union Army of the Potomac has a very interesting command structure here during the Battle of Fredericksburg. Uh, Burnside organizes every, everything into what's called those grand divisions. Usually uh, pertain to about two corps each. Below a corps you're going to have about three divisions per corps. Below that you got three to four brigades. Below that three to five regiments. Kind of just to break it down for you. I mean there's a lot of forces now. This is still 1862 so uh, the numbers for the regiments individually are still between like 600 and 800. Uh, they're going to continue to go down due to sickness and casualties, of course. Uh, but these are still very, very large units here. So we're standing in the position that would have been occupied by William B. Franklin and his left grand division. They're known as the left grand division because generally as they were moving, they're to the left of Burnside's maps. They're also on the left side. They're on the left flank. We're basically sitting on the left flank of the Union line. Behind me is Route 2 today, but at the time it was known uh, by a few names, the Bowling Green Road or the old Richmond Stagecoach Road. Uh, and this is where all the Union artillery of the Left Grand Division is really going to anchor along. Uh, the Left Grand Division is going to contain two corps, the 1st Union Corps and the 6th Union Corps. The 6th Corps being under the command of uh, William Bolly Smith. Uh, I believe you have ancestors in the 6th Corps. Love that 6th Corps. Yep, gotta love the 6th Corps. I have ancestors in the 1st Corps. Uh, and they were commanded by a man by the name of John Fulton Reynolds. Uh, and John Reynolds, he has fame from what other battle? Gettysburg. And he's from Lancaster, right? I believe, mm -hmm. yes. So he's a Lancaster native. Uh, and so we're going to really be talking about those command structures. Under his command, he's got three divisions. Uh, he has Abner Doubleday, I believe a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. He's a New Yorker. Yep. And we have John Gibbon from North Carolina, which is, hey, Unionist sentiments always cool. Yeah, uh, we love those. We love those we Southerners love those who yeah. stay loyal to the uh, <laughs> to the United States Army. Pretty much. And finally, we got uh, good old George Gordon Meade, uh, also a Pennsylvanian. And we know Meade as the commander of the Union Army at Gettysburg. Uh, but here, he's just a division commander. And when I say just a division commander, Meade is climbing the ranks pretty quickly here. And so is Reynolds. Meade and Reynolds have served in close capacity to one another. Uh, for most of their time here in the Eastern Theater. And I like to highlight these two gentlemen because yes, they are Pennsylvanians, but they're probably two of the most famous Pennsylvanian generals for the entire war. Um, and some for, for different reasons, and uh, some of those reasons are validated or not. Uh, but I think talking about them here in this position so close to the old stagecoach road, uh, we can start to discuss some of the problems within the command structure here. Uh, do you want me to just Yeah, just yeah. keep All right, going. so yeah. Uh, to continue, as I said, artillery line is going to align here along the road. Uh, you can't see it, but behind the camera here, uh, and you'll see it momentarily, would have been the hills of Marie's Heights. Uh, we are towards the southern portion, so Prospect Hill is in our proximity. And William B. Franklin and the Left Grand Division, they have the responsibility now to ass assault this position. This is one of those punches we had talked about. And um, as Ryan already said, this is a overall attack. This isn't supposedly a diversion. However, it's a good opportunity to bring up kind of the orders here. So we're gonna start at the top. It's the easiest way to do this. Look at Ambrose Burnside's orders. Burnside is telling both Grand Division commanders, Franklin over here on the left, Edwin V. Sumner on the right with Joseph Hooker in the center Grand Division in the center. Um, he's telling Sumner and Franklin basically to make massive assaults here on either sides of the line. However, when Burnside pens these orders, he's telling Franklin to commit at least a division to this assault. And here we see how important language is, because at least a division, how would you interpret that? Well, okay, maybe I'll just send one or maybe two. Uh, but you know, Burnside is wanting Franklin to assault this position. Franklin interprets that differently. Another thing that makes it 
an issue is I'd love to defend Burnside at this battle, uh, but in this particular case, when he writes these orders, he doesn't give it to Franklin till the morning of December 13th, and the, and the attack was supposed to occur at dawn. Uh, Franklin doesn't get these orders till roughly 7, seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, he's not ready to assault till about 10 o'clock. Mm, so I'm getting we're, shades of like Burnside, what happens to him at, at Antietam. Exactly. McClellan, and that's a whole other story. But yeah, yeah, carry on, no, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the command structure breaking down here. So Franklin has these orders, and now he's not sure of what they mean. Is this the main attack or not? Or is that one up there towards the stone wall the main assault? Uh, so in the aftermath of this battle, just to kind of jump ahead real quick, uh, William B. Franklin is brought before the Committee of the Conduct of War, and it's on that committee that he will actually defend himself by saying, look, my orders were not clear. I believed that my assaults here were supposed to be a demonstration, or at least the diversion. In his mind, this assault down here is the diversion, but it's interesting because there's 65,000 Union soldiers in position in this vicinity. There's multiple farms behind the houses here. These houses, of course, not being period of the time. But back there, there was more swampy areas, more open farmlands. You had the Benz farm, you had Mansfield plantation, you had the Bernard plantation. Uh, there are slave quarters in this vicinity, closer towards the hills. And we're standing right now in an open field. This field's going to be a considerable kill zone later on in the day of December 13th. But nevertheless, in the morning, the attacks get started from here. You have John Reynolds probably riding back and forth along Route 2 behind us. And he's going to be conferring with his division commanders. Now, like I said, we already named those three division commanders. They're going to be the first ones into the fray. And so in this position, you would have seen George Gordon Meade taking his PA reserves forward. On his right is John Gibbon and his multiple units uh, of men. And I didn't really mention the PA reserves, I just realized getting started. The Pennsylvania reserves uh, are a very famous unit at this point. There's three brigades of them. They're all Pennsylvania regiments, obviously, but they have gained a reputation of being pretty tenacious fighters. Uh, they do very well at the Seven Days Battle. They do very well at Antietam uh, and at South Mountain, more notably. Um, so here they are spearheading this assault. John Gibbons divisions on their right. But before this attack even gets started, you have Confederate artillery coming from our south. Uh, way further down where we can't see there's a crossroads uh, today there is a gas station and I believe a CVS pharmacy mm -hmm. uh, but at that position at that crossroads would have been Confederate artillery of John Pelham and Pelham's guns are going to be lobbing artillery shells in this area and that's going to cause some confusion especially for General Reynolds so Reynolds now believing that most of the Confederates are in the front is now getting fire from his south from his left so he's got to send forces over there to cover that approach so already, this assault's gonna lose a division. Abner Doubleday's men are sent south of us towards that intersection, and that's where they're gonna stay mostly for the rest of the battle. We have to anchor this. Another thing that Reynolds is told by Baldy Smith of the Sixth Corps, Sixth Corps is not gonna be part of this assault. Sixth Corps is gonna be left in reserve. Typical. To, yeah, I know. They're gonna be left in reserve to guard the pontoon crossing. And while we might say, oh gosh darn it, that's, you know, that's unfortunate, to be fair, there is danger in assaulting a position with a river to your rear. You have one avenue of escape if anything goes wrong. If you can imagine 65,000 men trying to crowd over, I don't know, three rows of pontoons, that's gonna be a disaster, especially if there's Confederates right on their behinds. So you have to have the Sixth Corps guarding that reserve, but probably not all of them. <laughs> so right. so there, is, there is that seesaw back and forth there. But nevertheless, uh, Reynolds is going to only really have these two divisions to commit. Now, uh, the left rear division will get some reinforcements. It's going to be from Joe Hooker. He's going to send a few divisions of the con of the Union Third Corps over here. It's going to be David Bell Burney's division, as well as Daniel Sickles' division. These are all names that we're pretty familiar with uh, during the Gettysburg campaign and whatnot. Uh, but nevertheless, Reynolds is going to send Gibbon and Meade in first. Gibbon reaches the railroad cut. He goes no further. Meade is actually going to break through the Confederate line. And this is where things start to go south for the Union. Because even though Meade's going to have success in breaking that Confederate line, John Reynolds will take this time to almost disappear. Now, put something into context. This is Reynolds' really first time as a Corps commander. He was a division commander at the Seven Days Battle on the Peninsula during the Peninsula Campaign. And he was actually captured at Gaines Mills. But nevertheless, he's a very popular guy. He knows a lot of comfy uh, generals in high places, a lot of comfy politicians. And being a Pennsylvania, he's a prominent man, uh, good friends with Andrew Curtin, I believe. Yeah, he's the governor of Pennsylvania at the time. And so what's interesting here is that John Reynolds has risen through the ranks very quickly 
But in this case, he may have been a little outside his element. This is his first time as a Corps commander. And if you're John Reynolds, you got really no vantage point here. You have trees in front of you and your men just disappear into those trees. You can't really ride forward without endangering your own life here. Uh, you also, you know, have the answers from the rear. You have the answers coming from uh, from Franklin saying, look, you got what you got and this is what you're gonna do with it. So really you just have Reynolds alone on his horse here, kind of just waiting and really not doing anything. So he decides, you know what, I'm gonna do something useful. I'm gonna go help the First Corps artillery make sure their guns are sighted. That's under Charles Wainwright, the artillery brigade commander of the Union First Corps. And basically Reynolds is gonna spend the rest of the morning with them, helping them sight their guns. Now, Reynolds had been an artilleryman, so it was something he knew, something he was comfortable with. Is this an instance of a man that's trying to shirk his duty or a man that's just trying to make himself useful where he knows how? So I think it's something to consider here, but Reynolds, nevertheless, is not going to be in this position when George Meade rides off Prospect Hill and comes back in this area. Now, the, as I said, PA Reserves, they were successful in breaking the line, but because there are no available reinforcements, none are coming from the Sixth Corps, those PA Reserves get into a very hot pickle when the Confederates start to counterattack and get reorganized. So Meade rides back here, and the only body of troops in this vicinity is David Bell Burney's 3rd Union Corps Division. Now Burney is an abolitionist, very rare in the Union Army, um, and he is also a veteran soldier. He's been on the peninsula, he's been in many of the battles so far, but here's the thing. Burney got reprimanded during the Seven Days Battle for acting without orders. He is not going to act here until he has confirmation from a superior commander. He doesn't want to land in hot water again. So when George Meade of the same rank rides up to General Burney, Burney's going to basically hear Meade say, hey, you need to bring your guys behind me. My guys are getting you know, cut to pieces up there. I need your help. And Burney says, I'll be happy to help you. I just need clarification from your corps commander first. So we need John Reynolds. Well, George Meade looked around and we can't find John Reynolds. And so there's this, now a breakdown in command. This is where things start to get all muddy because now Meade, in the moment when he needs it most, when he needs Reynolds the most, no one can find Reynolds. And so, you know, Meade basically just starts tearing Bernie apart verbally. He has a notorious reputation of being one of great profanity. The old Bernie. snapping turtle. The old goggly eyed snapple, snapping tur snapple turtle. I like that better. <laughs> But nevertheless, uh, Bernie, you know, basically says, I'm sorry, man, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, I can't, not yet, I'm sorry. Well, by this time, too many precious minutes have wasted away, and the PA reserves are starting to fall back. You would have seen them coming back through these fields to the Union lines, uh, kind of in little pockets at first, carrying wounded soldiers back. Uh, but nevertheless, the Confederates are going to recapture that uh, <coughs> position on Prospect Hill. And so this was probably one of the best opportunities mm -hmm. Uh, that the that the um, Union Army has to succeed here, and it wastes away, really on the footsteps or at least at the feet of these two Pennsylvania commanders. Uh, George Meade, on one hand, is very successful doing what he was supposed to do, but John Reynolds, on the other hand, is absent in a critical moment, a moment that is going to be uh, examined later on. And the thing is, John Reynolds will take uh, uh, at least uh, responsibility for this afterwards. He does say, "Yeah, I was the gun." Uh, elsewhere along the line. Doubleday was further down here. I conferred with him at some point to assess the situation on our left. And at any point, William B. Franklin can come forward and also supersede these orders, but Franklin is not going to do that. And Franklin's waiting for orders from Burnside, and Burnside's on the other side of the river. So what we see here is a very complicated command structure and a breakdown within it. And because of that, this attack's going to fall apart. This opportunity is going to slip away. And I think that's very important to know here. It's not the fact that the men can't get through. It's not the fact that they can't succeed here. Union soldiers on the ground are very successful in doing what they're ordered to do. But unfortunately, there's this issue we call fog of war. It comes up many times. Mm. Things just fall apart. And it, sometimes it's expected. Sometimes, most of the times it's not. Uh, it's things you can't account for. And communication issues like this one, just absent generals, you know, really thinking they're helping and they're not, or, you know, other situations like that. Right. You're going to see that happen here at Fredericksburg very blatantly. So there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of commanders that could probably take responsibility for the failure here. It could be John Reynolds, could be William B. Franklin. Ultimately, it's Ambrose Burnside. And he does take responsibility for it because he is the commander of the army. The commander of the army will take responsibility for the overall failure here. So we'll dive in more to the experiences of those who engage in that attack mm -hmm. um, at some of our next uh, stops. 
Um, I do want to just ask kind of, um, I'll, I'll pick your brain here a little okay. bit and see. So you talked about uh, Reynolds and Mead, and they are going to go on to have more, well, let's say more successes and acclaim. Um, some of the, their careers last longer than others. Um, <laughs> yeah. But what would you say is the, ex like, what did they take away from their Fredericksburg experience, uh, these, these two commanders? Well, what's interesting is that John Reynolds, you know, he doesn't really get close, like I had said, he doesn't get really close to the lines itself to see what's going on, mm -hmm. um, and kind of far back a ways. And I think he realizes here as a corps commander, you, to really assess the situation of your men down to the division level, you need to really be in it with them. And so that could be part of the reason why a couple months later at Gettysburg, he's right there in the front of the line, at the tip of the sword, when things are the hottest. So, I mean, I think for Reynolds, it's all about finding that middle ground of where a corps commander should be on the ground. And it should also be noted that he's new to it. For George Meade, on the other hand, uh, Meade is going to rise through the ranks. He's going to get promoted after this battle. He becomes a corps commander for Chancellorsville, commands the fifth corps. And uh, George Meade, after that, as we know, will be uh, picked for uh, the commander of the army. Now, what I think is very interesting is that if you were to ask somebody after Hooker's failure in Chancellorsville who was going to replace him, everyone in the army is telling you either John Reynolds or George Meade, two prominent Pennsylvania commanders, and both of them are the two most likely candidates. Some others were saying Darius Couch just because he was the executive officer of Joe Hooker, but Couch quits, goes to another department. He does not stay with the army. So really, it's down to these two candidates, Reynolds and Meade. Okay. Um, and I think that's really interesting how, how that kind of works. And I think it serves to their credit that they're both, how quickly they rose through the ranks and how quickly they adjusted to these. Because Meade, Fifth Corps doesn't really do a lot during Chancellorsville, but they, they're they pretty significant in that first day fight. Now right. They first, and they're also very well disciplined because of their commander. I think he has a very level head, an aggressive mind, and a very smart tactical mind. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Avery, for yeah. this, and uh, thank you all for watching, and we will see you uh, in a f just a few minutes. Um, we'll get another stream going here from the Slaughter Pen Farm. Thank you so much. Thanks.